Overcoming lukewarm Christianity, finding true spiritual fire is not for the weak and feeble. It takes a resolute heart to ignite the spiritual fire. If you acknowledge that your relationship with the Lord is lukewarm and you desire a way to overcome it, I just want you to stay tuned. I have a few insights that might assist you in moving beyond the state and creating a solid relationship between you and the Lord your God. At this point, we're going to finish next week. Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. About true spiritual fire, I'm not talking about the Pentecostal charismatic Holy Ghost fire. This is the most unbiblical belief held by millions. And I say this based on the fact that this made up phrase is not even in the Bible, nor is it the teaching of it. And if it is, I want you to show me where and show me the context of what verses or passages you're giving me. A main verse that they use is Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11. Indeed, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but he, Jesus, that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He, speaking of Jesus again, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. This is not the Holy Ghost fire. I personally haven't found any references where the Holy Ghost is fire or baptizes with fire. They see certain words and they just invent with the few words that are there, put in a couple of prepositions, a couple of conjunctions, and all of a sudden they come out with a new doctrine. It doesn't work like that. Now please notice, Jesus is the one doing the baptizing, not the Holy Ghost in verse 11. It's nowhere found in that verse or anywhere else in the Bible that the Holy Ghost baptizes anybody with fire. Jesus is baptizing either with the Holy Ghost or with fire. Now Jesus will come and he has the power to baptize with both the Holy Ghost and with fire, but then it's either the Holy Ghost or the fire. Every person is baptized with only one of those baptisms, not both. A believer cannot receive both baptisms of the Holy Ghost and fire. Being baptized with fire means to be thrown in hell. So when they say, I want to be baptized with fire, you're asking God to throw you in hell. And if you don't believe me, just reread Matthew chapter 3 verses 11 and 12. The context of the word fire is found right in the next verse. And what he's talking about, the baptism of fire, it's a judgment. Now Jesus' baptism of fire is explained again in verse 12. The context is the tribulation of Daniel's 70th week. More specifically, it's the cleanup of earth's inhabitants before entering into the millennial kingdom. That's what the context is. Look at verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, speaking of Jesus, and he, Jesus, will truly purge his floor and gather his wheat into to the garner and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Do you see the two actions that are taking place over here? He's gathering and he's going to be burning. Take verse 12 now and connect it to verse 11. Don't start inventing the baptism of the Holy Ghost fire. It doesn't work like that. You can't play around with words like that. Now two things are going on here. There's a gathering of wheat and a burning of chaff. The burning of the chaff with unconscionable fire represents a judgment or punishment that is eternal and cannot be extinguished. It's an eternal fire. The use of unquenchable fire is a powerful and emphatic way of expressing the severity and the permanence of Jesus' judgment. Listen to my words carefully now. Which people brought upon themselves. He does not pick and choose who goes to heaven. So in God's foreknowledge, he already knew who the wheat was going to be and who was going to be burnt with unquenchable fire. So people bring judgment upon their own selves. Jesus does not pick and choose who goes to heaven and who basically is hell bound. This judgment, it's at his second coming. You'll find it in Matthew chapter 24 verses 40 and 41 where one is taken and the other left. And I'm not going to get into this one because it's another Bible study. But just to give you the context of verse 12, Pentecostals charismatics, they love Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, but all of a sudden they seem to forget what comes right after it. So they're ascribing the fire to the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost is baptizing. I'll send you some Windex. Clean your glasses. Look at what it actually says. It's Jesus doing the baptizing, not the Holy Ghost. He's baptizing with the Holy Ghost. He's baptizing with fire. Where do you get that the Holy Ghost is fire? This next piece comes from a guy called Ernest Angley. I quote, 
This verse in Matthew makes it clear that there is something to be received other than the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The fire of the Spirit. Hey buddy, where are you going in life? The fire is the anointing of the Spirit. End quote. The fire of the Spirit does not exist in the Scriptures. He made that up. It sounds nice. It sounds spiritual. Wow, I would like some of that. What do you want? Why are you going after stuff that people are inventing? That's why there's a million and six denominations out there. So there's no fire anointing that the Holy Ghost is giving anywhere. I'm going to requote this guy. Then yield to the kindling of that spirit of fire. Where do you get the spirit of fire? Let it blaze out through your life. End quote. What, you're going to start hell here and finish it off over there? Are you feeling good? The conclusion is based on unfounded premises. Reading this guy Ernest Young's blog, not one scripture was given to sustain every piece of shit idea that came out of this guy's pen. I couldn't find a verse. You want to give me something so I can go study to make sure that it's actually biblical. And the amount of people, they were giving all kinds of donations. Well, the blind following the blind. So not one verse was given to sustain or prove his twisted hellish doctrine. Yes, I said it. It was hellish doctrine. If you think I'm wrong, show me where I'm wrong. But make sure if you're going to pull out a verse, make sure it's in biblical context. Let's get back. We're looking at lukewarm Christianity. You're part of millions of believers that are lukewarm without you reading realizing it and thinking that that's the norm. Everybody is like that. Because of everyone in your church and your congregation, they're like that, I guess I must be like that. I should be like that. You're just there doing whatever these people are doing. And everyone in your church or congregation, they're just there and they're living a blah life. I've been in some of these churches. You come, you do this, that, 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 the other thing, you go home. And everything is on repeat. At one point, your spiritual growth stunts. It starts shriveling up. You start going backwards. How do I know? I've already been there, done that. Be very careful in what church that you guys are in. Because the crap that's coming over the pulpits. At the time, I didn't think it was crap, but it's only after. Hindsight is always 2020. When I start thinking of the stuff that they were giving me, it sounded nice, it sounded spiritual, but it did nothing for me. It did nothing to strengthen the inner man. And this is the job of the preacher to strengthen the inner man. And because of this, what's happening in the church is it's slowly killing your relationship between you and your God. And eventually, it's going to cost you your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. The works of a lukewarm believer is carnal. If you're lukewarm, you haven't lost your salvation. That's it. I think I just lost half the people. And the rest of them, I think they've slid off their chairs. It doesn't take much to freak some people out. You know that? I know, I know. If you're lukewarm, Jesus is going to spew you out of his mouth. Hang on. I've got something for you now. So for you that you're so quick to quote scripture without verifying the context, you totally twisted this verse out of its intended meaning. You're taking a severe warning that Jesus is giving to a tribulational saint. Did you hear what I just said? You're taking a warning given to a tribulational saint and you're jamming it down the throat of the Pauline church? Are you feeling good? Change pusher. So let's go check out Revelation 3.16. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Either you're in or you're out. That's what Jesus is basically saying. You need to understand the context of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. That is not the Pauline church. What is given to those churches the tribulational saints, it's all works based. So the context of Revelation 3.16 is Daniel's 70th week, the tribulational saints are working to keep a salvation, to work towards a salvation, and they have to make sure that it's at par every second of the day. Because works is now necessary for them to be saved. The churches of Revelation 2 and 3 are works based. I'll give you an example. If you go to verse 1 in chapter 3, Jesus mentions, I know thy works. Verse 2, Jesus says, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Verse 5, Jesus says, he that overcometh. Paul never spoke this way. We have nothing to overcome. It was already overcome 2,000 years ago. That's what you need to understand. You are in the tribulation. You need to understand when John was in the Lord's day, the Lord's day is plastered all over the Old Testament. What is the Lord's day? God picks him up and he says, I'm going to bring you to a point and I'm going to show you what my day is going to look like that we're talking about in the Old Testament. Verse 8, I know thy works. Verse 15, I know thy works. Verse 21, to him that overcometh, I have to overcome nothing because Jesus already did it for me. So for you to take Take Revelation chapter 316 and cram it down my throat that I have to be either hot or cold. Uh, you got another thing coming. But what about now if somebody is lukewarm?
lukewarm. Like I said, they do not lose their salvation. Their works is carnal. So under the gospel of the grace of God, there are two types of believers. You've got the spiritual believer and you've got the carnal believer. A carnal believer is saved. Every believer starts off being a carnal believer. A carnal believer is sanctified day by day by his daily sanctification and that's going to draw him closer to the spiritual walk with his God upon this earth. Nobody starts off as a spiritual believer. When you come to the Lord for the first time, you just walked out of the world. You are dirty and the Lord says, Come, I'm going to start sanctifying you. I'm going to start cleaning you up day by day. And it's a piece at a time and thank God that he does that. So if you assert that a carnal believer has lost his salvation because of his carnal works, which could include dishonesty, deceit, lying, jealousy, envy, strife, divisions, pride, arrogance, lustful thoughts, anger, hatred, gossip, slander, then congratulations to you. Because of your theological interpretation of unrightly dividing the word of truth, nobody can stay saved according to you nor can ever be. All that got saved got lost that same day because they probably thought something or they said something right after they got saved. And if they're lucky, they maybe stayed saved for a 24-hour period. Does that make sense to you? Question, if you lost your salvation on account of a quote-unquote work that you did, what work could you possibly do to actually regain it? What work have you performed to obtain your salvation in the first place? And if your answer is none, what work can you possibly do to actually regain it should you lose it? It was given to you as a gift. You lost it. How do you want to get a gift back? You're going to go back to the person and say, hey, can you give it to me again? Because you don't know about the doctrine of imputation, because you don't know that we're filled and sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, because you don't know about the spiritual circumcision and spiritual baptism, that we're baptized into the body of Christ, all of a sudden, of course you can lose your salvation. Get your head out of Ezekiel. We are not in the days of Ezekiel. We are under what Jesus Christ gave to Paul. Whatever Paul spoke, that's what we're under. We are not under Ezekiel, Jeremiah, or even Isaiah. Because if you read those books, if you read Job, it was all their righteousness. There's the righteousness of the Old Testament, and there's the righteousness of the New Testament. And if you don't believe me, why don't you go read Romans chapter 10 and verse 3, and see what it says. It talks about two righteousnesses that Paul is talking about. So he's making the distinction of one versus the other. So don't come and tell me that there's only one type of righteousness. Paul calls the carnal believer babes in Christ. When you are in Christ, you're spiritually baptized, circumcised, and sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And that's where you become a child of God. That's where you become a son of God. Only then does this happen. And when it does, you're in Christ. You can have useless carnal works and you can still be saved. So at the judgment seat of Christ, your bad works, your carnal works are going to be put into the fire. But what does it say in 1 Corinthians 3.15? Your works are going to be burnt, but you're going to be saved so as by fire. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, Paul speaking, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I can't talk to you spiritually because you guys are not at that level yet. You guys are a bunch of little kids. You're still in your carnality. Now, lukewarmness entails a sense of neutrality or indifference, particularly in relation to your spiritual beliefs or connections with God. It involves not feeling particularly excited or passionate about your faith and relationship with the Lord. Instead, it often signifies a state of complacency where you are not actively engaged or enthusiastic about your spiritual life. That is your walk with your Lord here in this world. Complacency is a state of self-satisfaction, of contentment that leads to a lack of awareness, vigilance, or lack of sense of urgency. You're okay where you are. Life is beautiful and you just don't want to move. That's where you start becoming lukewarm. Instead of having a heart for God and to say, let's forge for the Lord. Let's go witness. Let's go do something. Let the Lord be magnified through our lives, through our lips, through our actions. There you're not lukewarm, there you're hot. But if you're sort of like, okay, no, everything's fine. A lot of churches like this, you don't want to cause any waves. Everything is beautiful. No, brother, don't, no, don't even go there. Give you a shot in the head. It involves the feeling of being comfortable with your own current situation and often at the expense of recognizing or addressing potential risks as your lack of spiritual growth or learning or living in a carnal state maybe for the rest of your days. There's a lot of believers, they live in a carnal state. 
state, they're saved, but they're worthless. They're a bunch of worthless Christians. Again, complacency involves a feeling of being comfortable with your own current situation, wherever you're at, and often at the expense of recognizing or addressing potential challenges or opportunities to improve your walk in the Spirit or the relationship that you have with God through prayer and reading of the Scriptures. One place where lukewarmness is fostered is in the churches through the leadership. It's done through its teachings and misguided values. That's what's coming over the pulpit. This is what the people are receiving and this is how they're acting it out. Church leaders are largely responsible for the church's lukewarmness. The other percentage of the responsibility falls on you, the believer. Going to a church where the preacher and teacher is dead, meaning that there's no reproving, no rebuking, no correction coming from over the pulpit, that's not helping you out. It's keeping you at that level. But if I can reprove, rebuke, and exhort, whatever it is that I have to do, my words have to get into your head. I gotta be able to grab your heart, to squeeze it, and to say, hey, what you doing? To be able to turn it inside out and just show it to you and says, this is what you look like, you piece of disgusting filth. There's a lot of good preachers out there, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of good churches, but there's more complacent, lukewarm churches than there are good, solid churches. You go to those solid churches, you get out of there, you feel revived, you feel like, thank you, thank you. It's like, I want to go do something now. The guy did his job. But when you walk into a church and everything is nice, nice, you got to watch what you say because you don't want the congregation to get up and leave because that's money leaving out the door. I was told that I was supposed to be careful behind the pulpit what I was saying because you don't want to rock the boat. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I said, have a nice life. That's basically what I said. I'm not going to get into the particulars of the words. Let's keep going. And in these churches, nor is there any exhortation or any edification on their end. The messages are basically dead. You don't remember anything that the preacher or teacher said 10 minutes after the preaching was done. Whatever was said was lost in the wind. It just fell to the ground. They are doing the opposite of what the Apostle Paul ordained for fear of losing their congregation. And that's really, really sad. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove. They're not doing it. Rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. They're not even doing that. They're pulling out Holy Ghost fire. Are you for real? What school did you go to? For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and they shall be turned onto fables. The Holy Ghost fire, that's a fable because you can't prove it from the scriptures. And the people that are under these preachers, they're the ones that have turned their ear from the truth. When God was giving out brains, you heard trained and you missed yours. Now, am I placing too much on a preacher teacher? Absolutely. You're in back over here. You're supposed to be the shepherd. I'm supposed to be a shepherd. And it's my job to tend to the sheep. It's my job to water and to feed the sheep. It's my job to protect them from the sh doctrines that are out there. I'll tell you one story. Most of you already know this. A guy came in here 45 minutes and all the crap that he put on the table. It took me 40 hours to go through the scriptures to make sure that I'm understanding what this guy is saying. More beside the track it can be. Biblical doctrine is basically out the window and it's replaced with alternative teachings and ideologies that are not even biblical and they're leading the body of Christ astray. Paul said, study to show yourselves approved. And they took it out of all the other Bibles. Ask yourself the question, why? A big part of the responsibility lies on these men. Yes, I said men. If you got a problem with that, go talk to Paul. He's the guy that wrote the book. Now I'm talking to preachers, teachers. If the Lord truly called you to preach or to teach, you will see the fruits of your labor, not in the number of programs that you have in your church, not in the numbers of people that you've got sitting in your congregation. Yes, uh, I've got 2,000 in my church. How many do you got? Yeah, I got about 50. No, I got about 2,500. What are you guys playing golf? It's not the number of the congregants that you have accumulated, but the fruits of the transformed and changed lives. That's how you're supposed to be looking at your church. What I look at, I want to have one 
to 10 people. But the people that I have, they're here because they want to be here, because they want to learn. And it's my job to put you on fire to go out there and do whatever it is that you have to do. You're going to see the transformed and changed lives in your congregation. And for this reason, Jesus instituted the different offices. Jesus Christ through Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why did Jesus Christ do that? For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why was this needed? Till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. They're waiting to see the guy that comes out of a church to see if they could deceive them. But if you're solid on your feet, they'll never be able to do that. Lukewarmness is as if you're neither hot, that is enthusiastic or passionate about the things of God, your salvation, and your relationship with God, nor are you cold that is completely uninterested in God, Jesus Christ, and the Bible. But you're sort of like somewhere in between. You're not there, you're not there, ah, you're sort of like, now don't forget, I'm speaking all of this under the gospel of the grace of God. So being lukewarm is a state of spiritual complacency or indifference. Ah, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, too bad. Lukewarm refers to a condition where one's commitment to and passion for the relationship with their God diminishes. That's where you're at. Like literally with any relationship, if there's no nurturing in that particular relationship, the relationship is basically going to start dying. The process is gradual. It starts off with a raging fire. It goes to a flame, it goes to a flicker, and then it goes to a mere spark. How do I know this? It happened to me in my life, where I was up and at one point I was just coming down. The Lord caught me just before I hit rock bottom. Lukewarmness could happen when you are 100% implicated in the church in the programs, the functionality of the different departments in the church, the Sunday schools, the guys taking care of the doors, the elders and whatever else. And you're basically involved in all the different ministries, even making sure that the toilets are clean. So you're worried about all of these things. And because of this misguided value, you're worried about everything else. You forgot about you and the inner man. If you don't strengthen the inner man, you are going to start sliding back. You can be going to church 16 times a week. It means nothing. Because here you start focusing on the externals instead of the internal. That's where the Holy Ghost resides, remember? That's where the war is actually raging. That's where the flesh and the spirit are having it out. And you're worried if the toilet is clean. Hey, who cares, man? You're there for you to learn. When you're worried about the outside and you're not worried about your inside, you are in deep trouble. The second place you develop lukewarmness is through lack of personal commitment to the Lord and fellowship with the Lord. Realizing your lukewarmness is your first step in restoring your full fellowship with the Lord your God. Now this is going to be an upward battle and it's not for the faint-hearted. Believe me, when I had to climb out of that, we call it backsliding. It was coming to a point where I loved the Lord, I knew I was saved, I just didn't feel like it anymore. Ah, I don't, no, forget it, no. I was basically in a slump and try to get out of that slump sometimes is really, really difficult. But the Lord had to jumpstart me. It's like, wake up, grab this car and go straight. It's like, whoa, that's what happened to me. My, my question to you is, how bad do you want it? Being lukewarm is showing little interest, enthusiasm, or even indifference towards God, Jesus Christ, and the Bible. So ask yourself, what got you this way? What did you see? What did you hear that turned the heat from your heart down low? I know what happened to me. So knowing that, I have to guard myself. That's why I got a hard time walking into certain churches. And notice I didn't say all churches. There's a lot of solid preachers out there. And if you find one of these preachers, my friend, hang on to their belt and just don't let go. Because guys like that, they're very, very hard to find. Speaking personally to you now, your lukewarmness, where did it come from? You neglecting your relationship between you and the Lord. Lukewarmness is achieved through infrequent prayer, lack of personal Bible study, and a diminishing sense of God's presence in your daily life. This will result in a weakening of your spiritual connection or relationship with the Lord. By you reinstating prayer on a daily basis, don't be a Muslim to pray five times a day. It's a constant communication between you and your God. So reinstating prayer, Bible study, and meditation in your life. 
life. These will reverse the lukewarmness which you are actually experiencing. In Psalm 145, 18, it says, The Lord is nigh unto them that call upon Him. How do you call upon Him? It's prayer. And you call upon Him all day long. It's not that you have a specific time. It's a relationship. It's like you and your wife or a girlfriend or a child or a co-worker, whatever. It's not that, oh, it's, it's, it's four o'clock. I got to go talk to my wife. I got to go talk to my husband. No, you just speak. So the Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Don't be a hypocrite because God sees through it. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Psalm 1.2 But his delight, speaking of the believer, is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. This person is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. It's not something that he does once in a while. Because you're planted there, you're meditating on the Lord day and night. The fervent love that you're going to have for God, the fervent heart that you're going to have and all the actions that you're going to be doing stems from this. If you're doing these three things, you're studying the Word. You're actually meditating on God's Word day and night. You're actually talking to Him on a daily basis. How can you ever be lukewarm? You're in the hot section. In the lukewarm section, oh, I remember, yeah, yeah, I remember getting saved a couple of years ago. Really? Are you really saved? But then there are those, like me, like a whole bunch that I knew, that we were lukewarm. To the point that we started regressing to going back to the world. Slowly, slowly, we ended up coming back to the Lord. Did I lose my salvation? Absolutely not. You know why? Because way down in my heart, there was a commitment that I made to the Lord. I believed with my heart, confessed with my mouth, that death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. What else is going to make you lukewarm? Compromising values and beliefs. Engaging in behaviors inconsistent with godly values whatever you're going to be reading in the scriptures, compromising moral standards or conforming to worldly influences are going to result in a spiritual lukewarmness due to the departure of the core principles of our faith, of your faith. Look at Psalm 119 verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Hiding God's word means knowing God's ways and God's morality. By not sinning against him, against God, means to do or apply the the word that you just learned or memorized. Thy word have I hid in mine heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. Because this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where your relationship with the Lord is actually going to come forth. Because you're my best friend, I don't want to screw up with you. What else is going to make you lukewarm? Routine and ritual without passion. Going through rituals and practices without genuine enthusiasm or heartfelt engagement becomes religious in nature. You just do it because you have to. Remember, you don't have to do anything. I have to go to church. No, stay home in bed and make my life easier. The spiritual vitality factor gets eradicated from your personal relationship with the Lord when you are somewhat thinking that you're forced to do it. Okay, I'm going to go do it. They look like an orangutan and their hands are dragging on the floor. <laughs> when you are forced to, the transformative impact of God's Word on your being is being made null and void. Because you're walking in like this, you're never going to get it. By doing what is prescribed, because you decide desire to do it. You desire the changes and your mindset towards the relationship you have towards God. That's where you're going to start seeing results. Do you do it because you have to? And I'm asking you the question. You have to do absolutely nothing. That's what I'm telling you to do. Why are you going to church? So you can show the other person how spiritual you are. You piece of hypocrite, you. Just stay home in bed. Doing it because you have to or doing it because you want to? That's where the big difference is. Materialism and worldly pursuits. Listen to my words. Placing focus on material possessions, career success, or worldly ambitions at the expense of spiritual priorities. There's nothing wrong with these things. But when you're axing all of your mind in this world, in your work, and you're letting go of your spirituality, that's where you lose the game. Prayer, reading your Bible, meditating on God's Word. You gave that up so you could pursue your worldly affair things. Good for you. The flesh is nice, but the spirit is weak. And what happens when the flesh overtakes the spirit? A person must have lost their salvation. No, they didn't. They just changed their focus. They just changed their values. And by you going after the world, God's Word will dampen your enthusiasm and reduce your passion towards the Lord, causing lukewarmness to settle in your mind and heart. As worldly pursuits take precedence 
spiritual fervor diminishes. That's why John said in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If you're loving the world, there's no time to be loving the Father. And if you're loving the Father, He's the one that gives you the blessings in the world. People have gotten all screwed up. It's all backwards. Reverse it. Love God and He's going to give you everything that your heart desires. Verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. How do you get lukewarm? Ignoring convictions and conscience. Disregarding the prompting of the Holy Spirit, ignoring convictions and tolerating sin without repentance will result in spiritual apathy and diminish your sense of the need of a personal growth and holiness before God. This causes lukewarmness to be part of your being. In 1 Timothy 1.19 it says, Holding faith and a good conscience which some have put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. What's another thing that's going to make you lukewarm? Isolation from the body of believers. Neglecting fellowship with other believers reduces your accountability to God's standards, teachings, or expectations. At the same time, being encouraged in the faith. What did the writer of Hebrews say in chapter 10, verse 25? Not forsaking the assemblings of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. There is something about getting together with the brethren. When I had stopped going to churches, slowly, slowly, I started to back down a little bit more into the world. Very few people can be alone and be even stronger alone than they are in a regular church. These are the exceptions to the rule. So it's important to note that if you recognize these signs in your life, it is the first step towards addressing spiritual lukewarmness. Believers are encouraged to renew their commitment to a vibrant relationship with God through prayer, repentance, a return to the foundational spiritual practices, seeking accountability within a supportive body of believers. In closing, to eradicate your lukewarmness from your life, have a wholehearted devotion towards God. So how do you get this wholehearted devotion towards God? I want you to turn to Mark chapter 12 and verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. You start loving God, you cannot be lukewarm. You study, you read, you meditate, you cannot be lukewarm. You're going to be so hot for the Lord and the Lord can start using you out there. But if you're lukewarm, how do you want the Lord to use you? There is no way that He can use a piece of useless pottery. He's pouring something in for you to do, but you've got a hole and it's just going out. You're just wasting it. My final point, cultivating true spiritual fire. I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. Rejoice evermore. Every day, rejoice. 50, 100 times a day, rejoice. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Have your continual relationship between you and your God. From the moment you open your eyes to the moment you close your eyes, make sure that you're praying, you're talking without ceasing, you're talking to God. Verse 18, in everything give thanks. On a daily basis before going to bed, count your blessings. Have that attitude of gratitude towards the Lord. Once you start thanking God for even the littlest things, you watch going from complacency, lukewarmness, to actually becoming hot because your relationship between you and your Lord has just went up three notches. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Just following these three principles will ignite true spiritual fire in your heart and in your soul. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. If you haven't taken hold on eternal life, I want you to watch this three-minute video. Take a hold on eternal life. It's the best gift that you can give yourself. Have yourselves a good week. Lord willing, we see each other here next week.